Thousands of people marched across the Brooklyn Bridge today as part of an anti-hate rally. The rally held to stand in solidarity with the Jewish community that's found itself in the center of a number of recent hate crimes. According to NYPD, the city has seen 14 anti-Semitic attacks in just the past two weeks. In 2019, saw the highest number of anti-Semitic incidents that the ADL has ever tracked. Earlier this month, FBI Director Christopher Wray elevated racially motivated violent extremism to a national threat priority. You know, whenever somebody's amassing weapons and wants to, you know, do damage, I mean, it's always potentially dangerous. Tonight, with the rate of infection increasing in cities across America, there are alarming new statistics. Over the past several weeks, we have seen a public display of outrage. We have not seen this in recent history. This historical moment demands that we not only say that Black Lives Matter, but that we show it. Democrats and Republicans overwhelmingly pass a hate crimes bill in both houses of the General Assembly. ADL has been actively leading efforts on hate crimes legislative advocacy in Georgia for decades, especially through ADL's leadership of the Hate Free Georgia Coalition, which played an important role in securing the law's passage. All kinds of organizations, whether Asian or not, need to know the extent of the hate crimes that are occurring. You can see uh, that racism has been rising in different parts of society and anti-Semitism has been rising in different parts of society. And that's why uh, Jonathan and I are in partner with Color Change and many other organizations to say, we must stop hate for profit. The goal is not to bankrupt Facebook. The goal is to create a conversation about the fact that they need to stop the flow of disinformation heading into this election. And it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, whether we are Democrats or Republicans or independents, we are one people. And we must respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. That's our calling. That's our mission. Good evening, and welcome to Never Is Now, ADL's annual summit on anti-Semitism and hate. It's hard to say that with an upbeat host voice, anti-Semitism and hate, because obviously there could not be a more sober subject. But honestly, I am upbeat because of how strengthening it is to be with all of you, albeit virtually, and because I felt so reassured and emboldened by ADL's work over this last unprecedented year. I would certainly prefer to be back in the cavernous Javits Center in New York City, sitting with each other in our multitudes of thousands of ADL stakeholders and supporters. But one positive is that there are no more restroom lines or boxed lunches. Seriously, thank you for joining us tonight. I know we've all been inundated by Zoom event invitations and it speaks volumes that you chose to be here. I am honored to be back hosting Never Is Now, and I could not feel more strongly that we need ADL in this moment, more than ever. As the oldest anti-hate organization in the world, ADL's century-old mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all continues to drive its work today. And they could not do it without your trust and support. This is an organization that is not only fighting daily on the front lines against anti-Semitism, but also battling the proliferation of hate online, monitoring and exposing extremism, and ensuring a just and fair society for every human being, regardless of religion or ideology. They have also worked tirelessly over the past few months towards ensuring a free, safe, and fair election. In the past year alone, ADL launched the crucial and successful Stop Hate for Profit campaign in partnership with leading civil rights organizations to demand that Facebook and other tech companies 
stop putting profit ahead of principles. They responded to thousands of reported incidents of anti-Semitism and bias and introduced their hate text hotline ahead of the election. This tool enables people to flag any potential hate crimes or disruptions involving extremists so that ADL can track potential dangerous activity in real time. ADL experts briefed government officials from around the world about the growing threat of extremism. They helped pass critical hate crime legislation in Georgia and continue to educate hundreds of thousands of students by sharing anti-bias programs and resources. ADL isn't simply reactive. It doesn't wait for the terrible event or social media cancer. It works to head them off. ADL's projects and priorities are so varied that rather than crowd them all into one dizzying hour tonight, Never Is Now is offering a fascinating menu of speakers and panel discussions over the coming days so that you have the opportunity to dive deeper into critical topics such as anti-Semitism across borders, how hate is moving from on campus to online, the evolution of Black Jewish relations in 2020, and the vital need for Holocaust education. You really are in for a treat, and we hope that you will join us over the next two weeks to hear from some of the brightest minds and experts, from a CEO's office to the halls of government, from a news anchor's desk to the classroom, from the pulpit to the playing field. I promise this program is not about pessimism, but positivity. After each panel you attend, all of you will have tangible resources and takeaways to help stop the spread of anti-Semitism and hate in your communities. Today, we are here together, thousands of miles apart, to learn, to expand our perspective, and to equip ourselves with a toolkit to fight hate for good. And now, without further ado, let's begin. Please give a warm virtual welcome to ADL's Chair of the Board of Directors, Esther Gordon Epstein. Thank you, Abby. Good evening and welcome to this year's Never Is Now Summit. I know it feels like we spend our lives in front of a screen, but I promise you the next two weeks will inspire you, even through your computer. I am sure that you, like me, have watched with horror at the headlines we have seen in the past few months. Extremist groups being asked to stand back and stand by. Terror plots to kidnap a sitting governor. Things I never could have imagined seeing in my lifetime. But there have been glimmers of hope as well. ADL's Stop Hate for Profit campaign brought together over a thousand companies to push Facebook to address hate on their platform. ADL took unprecedented action to protect voting rights and to combat extremism around the election. All of this work remains in service to our mission of more than 100 years to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. The leadership of our CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt, has never shined brighter than it has in these past nine months. When the pandemic descended in March, anti-Semitism and bigotry rose alongside it. And ADL doubled our efforts and has been fighting hate from home every day since. Never Is Now is a call for all of us to combat anti-Semitism, hate, and bigotry wherever we find it. From local incidents in your hometowns to the darkest corners of the internet. This is a monumental moment in history, and under Jonathan's leadership, ADL work has been more relevant than ever before. It is my privilege to work alongside Jonathan, and it is my pleasure to introduce him today. Please welcome ADL's CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt. Thank you, Esta, and thank you all for tuning in today for the fifth annual Never Is Now conference. There's so much to discuss, but before we get started, I want to pause and remember Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who left us too soon this weekend. 
Rabbi Sachs is an extraordinary leader, a remarkable teacher, a gifted statesman, and a beautiful man. He will be missed. May his memory always be for a blessing. Now we gather today virtually at what I think feels like the start of a new era. 2020 isn't over yet, but it's already been a roller coaster of historic highs and lows. And now we are on the precipice of a new presidency, one poised both in substance and tone to take our country in a new direction and initiate a process of healing. But before we explore what comes next, we need to take stock of where we have been. And so, as we do every year at Never Is Now, let's start with a review of the state of hate. When I stood at the Jacob Javits Center 12 months ago, I expressed my alarm about the normalization of anti-Semitism. And I thought I rang the bell as loud as I could. Little did we know that in the weeks after my remarks, New York City would be caught in a whirlwind of anti-Jewish violence. Indeed, 2019 will be remembered as the year when we saw the highest number of anti-Semitic incidents relative to any point in the prior four decades. Little did we know that a global pandemic would engulf the world and trigger new mutations of the oldest hatred. And little did we know that our politics actually would degrade even further, that a combative presidential season would generate even more anti-Jewish hatred. Now keep in mind that President-elect Biden has said publicly that he decided to run for office back in 2017 when he saw neo-Nazis with torches marching through Charlottesville, Virginia, spewing racist hate and chanting, Jews will not replace us. And yet in 2020, we saw non-Jewish candidates run grotesque ads, mocking their opponents with big noses or bags of money. We saw others deride their opponents as, quote, globalists or somehow under the thumb of George Soros. And yet perhaps it was even more consequential that candidates who spouted absurd anti-Semitic conspiracy theories linked to QAnon actually were elected to the U.S. Congress, while others who delegitimized the Jewish state also earned spots in the House of Representatives. And yet, there are compelling reasons to be thankful today. We can be thankful that, despite the worrying surge in anti-Semitic incidents, opinion polls show that the American people as a whole are not becoming more anti-Semitic, even if extremists feel emboldened. We should be thankful that a growing number of Arab and Muslim nations in the Middle East finally are moving away from their posture of reflexive rejectionism of the state of Israel and embracing a path of peace and normalization. And we should be thankful that despite the fact that we have a long way to go to fully address the racial divisions in this country, this past week, a record number of Americans selected a man as president whose hallmark traits, after nearly half a century in public life, are bipartisanship and decency. And those same voters selected a woman of color as vice president, the daughter of immigrants, a person whose ascension to the White House strikes me as a fitting rebuke to the racism, xenophobia, and misogyny of the past four years. Now, there may be some on the right who question their integrity, and others on the left who insist that they are too accommodating but I believe we can put aside partisanship on this day, pick up the paper or open our phones and take heart. This election was an affirmation of the promise of America. But it's also abundantly clear that the results also reflect a reality 
that so many of us see on a daily basis in our Facebook feeds or our neighborhoods, even at our very dinner tables. America is a deeply divided country. Such polarization and factionalization are not small things. They are like fissures in our democracy, cracks in the very foundation of our society. And history tells us that where there are cracks, we can expect extremism and hate to seep in. Indeed, in this past year alone, there have been at least 13 alleged terrorist plots, attacks, or threats perpetrated by right-wing extremists, including at least one thwarted terror plot against a synagogue and a foiled plan to kidnap and kill a sitting governor. But that isn't even the end of it. Indeed, radicalism can assume different forms and bodes ill in whatever shape it takes. Just a few weeks ago, the New York Times inexplicably ran a flattering op-ed about Louis Farrakhan, a piece that completely ignored his long and unapologetic record of hateful slurs and conspiratorial statements about Jews, the LGBTQ community, and women. Now, this oversight might strike some as small in the scheme of things, but you see, when hatred is ignored and defamation dismissed, it normalizes intolerance, and it makes it more acceptable for others to hold such dangerous views. And yes, Jews are the canary in the coal mine. But we know from our history that while hate might affect us first, eventually it infects all, regardless of politics or race, or faith, origin, etc. We see this in the white supremacist groups that ADL has been tracking for years. Toxic anti-Semitism indeed is core to their ideology, but it is also linked to virulent anti-immigrant, anti-black, and anti-Muslim views. Remember the Tree of Life shooter in Pittsburgh who killed Jews as they prayed on a Saturday morning in synagogue because he blamed them for bringing immigrants into the country. We saw this incendiary relationship between anti-Semitism and other forms of hate many times over the past few years. From the anti-Jewish memes pushed out during the 2016 campaign online to people denied entry at our airports based on their religion, because they came from predominantly Muslim countries, or toddlers torn from their parents' arms at the border simply because of their nationality. Now, ADL founders understood this link. It's why they committed this organization more than a century ago to the dual mission of stopping the defamation of the Jewish people and securing justice and fair treatment to all. They knew that if we allowed hate of any kind to flourish, it would hurt this country and especially its Jewish citizens. And so, now is the time for us to repair this foundation. Now is the time to move on from the debris of this past year and look forward to build a stronger, more durable society. That is the mission of ADL. It is the work before us. And I am personally so inspired and deeply humbled to be working alongside all of you in this fight. But a reasonable question is, how will we get it done? Well, first and foremost, I believe we need to prosecute the case against extremism with ferocity and fury without any hint of hesitation. After Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, El Paso, and so many other moments, it requires a stunning degree of willful ignorance to deny the danger of individuals and groups armed to the teeth and bent on conducting terror in the homeland against our community and its symbols 
as well as against our country and its institutions. It is time that the federal government take the offensive in the fight against extremism. It is time that Washington, D.C. brings the same level of energy and intensity to the fight against white nationalist terror as it has done and must continue to do in the fight against radical Islamist terror. In the weeks ahead, ADL will release our plan to fight white nationalism. Brace yourself. It will be the fight of our lives, but it is one we just can't afford to lose. But let's also have the intellectual honesty to recognize that the best way to stop violence is not after the fact, but to interrupt it before it happens. That's why at ADL we so deeply believe in anti-bias education. Again, not as an afterthought, but as an essential element in the war against hate. And I believe it's needed now more than ever. When we talk about the normalization of anti-Semitism, perhaps nothing is more disturbing than the casual injection of anti-Jewish toxins into our youth culture. I'm reminded of it when my kids tell me how anti-Semitic comments and hateful content seeps into their multiplayer video games. And I'm struck by it in photos of high school students snapping Heil Hitler salutes as if it is a joke. And I see it when I read about cemetery desecrations or view TikTok videos that mock the Holocaust. But what should we expect when nearly one third of Americans believe that substantially less than six million Jews were killed during the Shoah? And almost half of Americans can't even name a single concentration camp. What should we expect when some activists on the far left relegate Jews to the role of oppressors because we don't fit neatly into their social theories du jour? What should we expect when a public rally celebrating the end of slavery in the United States, one held right here in the city with the largest Jewish population of any metropolitan area in the world, is promoted as, quote, open to all except Zionists and cops. So this is why ADL will be putting our shoulder to the wheel of education from anti-bias curricula that's truly inclusive for all to genocide education programs that illustrate the horrors that can happen when hate goes unchecked. And there's an empirical case for this work. Research shows that students who have experienced Holocaust education are more open to different viewpoints and more comfortable with people from diverse backgrounds. Finally, no survey of the state of hate would be complete without mention of the role of social media. Whether you consider it the catalyst or the conduit, social media has been at the center of this storm of hate for more than a decade. It has done so as a driver of radicalization as a font of conspiracy theories, as a slow burning acid, weakening our foundation, post after post, tweet after tweet, like after like. And it inevitably targets the most vulnerable. Online harassment certainly isn't new, but this year we reached an inflection point. A 2020 survey conducted by ADL just prior to the outbreak of the pandemic, found that 44% of Americans had experienced online harassment and that members of marginalized communities in particular reported increased harassment targeting their identity-based characteristics like race, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation. And perhaps unsurprisingly, 77% of those who were harassed reported that at least some of that activity occurred on Facebook, far and away the largest and most profitable platform. Let me be clear about one thing. If we want to stop cyber hate and clamp down on online harassment, we need to remind ourselves of the Latin phrase, acta non verba. 
So how do we do that? Well, first, I believe that products are to be broken should be pulled from the shelves. You see this in every other industry in business. When a consumer product poisons its customers, you take it out of distribution. And so applications like Facebook groups that have amplified anti-Semitism, scaled racism, launched destructive movements like QAnon and the Proud Boys. Facebook groups needs to be shut down. And if Mark Zuckerberg can't finally fix Facebook groups, then he should put it out to pasture permanently. Second, it's long overdue to address the abusers on these platforms and those who try to hide their hate with smoke and mirrors, it is time to deal with their rancid prejudice. At ADL, we fought for the First Amendment for years. But the First Amendment doesn't give us the right to yell fire in a crowded theater, nor to slander those we dislike, let alone to incite violence against our supposed enemies. A year ago, my friend Sasha Baron Cohen stood in front, in front of this conference and said that when it comes to online hate, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach. And so today, I call on the social media services to take a long overdue step. Stop handing the microphone to those who exploit your services. Suspend them, eliminate their access, end it now. This goes for anti-Semitic white nationalists and others who traffic in rank racism, anti-Muslim bias and bigotry. This goes for Jew haters who hide their hatred in the guise of toxic anti-Zionism. This goes for discredited blog publishers or flim-flam artists who flirt with Hungarian fascists. This goes even for ex-public servants or active world leaders. Again, these people absolutely have a right to free expression, but press outlets, social media, these aren't soapboxes. They're businesses, plain and simple, and they have a sort of right of first refusal, let alone a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders and an ethical obligation to all of us. Platforms are a privilege. Abuse it and you should lose it. Finally, I came to this work five years ago as a staunch supporter of self-regulation but my naivete has been cured by experience. Big tech is just too big and too unaccountable. The time has passed to cross our fingers and simply hope for the best. At ADL, we will continue to work with these companies, but we're also preparing for a new phase to engage a new administration, to work with a new Congress, and to shape policy strategies that regulate these businesses to right the wrongs, revive competition, and restore decency online. But ultimately, to win this fight, to save our country, we need unity. As I've said before, our country is divided more so than at any time in memory. Our politics has been pushed to the brink by radicalism on all sides. Last month at the New Yorker Festival, I literally heard a well-known freshman member of Congress decry bipartisanship as if it were a bad word. She called it a vintage fantasy and a failed tactic of an earlier time. I could not disagree more. In fact, more than ever, we need to build bridges across the divides in our nation. We need to break free from our filter bubbles and to meet one another in the middle. And yes, that means sacrificing some of our priorities and acknowledging that another person might have ideas with equal validity. But 
That's exactly how democracy works. But before we can heal the nation entire, I would posit that the Jewish community needs to start at home. Within our community, we must reach out to one another. Jewish communal leaders need to embrace our increasingly multiracial community. Our institutions and organizations must do more to engage Jews of color with respect rather than tokenism. At ADL, we will do so because we know that we are richer for all the diverse members of our community, participating on our boards, serving among our professional ranks, and engaging with our volunteer networks. We also need to work across lines of observance. In the past year, I've spent time with Haredi communities in Muncie, and Jersey City, and Brooklyn, who suffered greatly from increased anti-Semitism of the past year. And look, we don't dress the same way. We don't pray the same way. We lead very different lives. But we are in this together. And so our predominantly secular communal institutions need to embrace the observant. And in the same way, we also must engage interfaith families with equal measures of empathy and energy, appreciating the role that they play in our diverse community and finding ways to work together around shared interests. And finally, in a message that I believe has resonance, regardless of how you identify or whether you daven, we must reach across the aisle to other Jews and to our fellow Americans from different political parties. The partisanship must end. I mean, how many of you have people in your social network that you can't speak to anymore? How many of you have friends that you no longer want to spend time with? How many of you have family members that you try to avoid? The corrosive politics of this time has contaminated our community. The self-righteousness bursting forth on cable news has brainwashed us all. You see, regardless of how you vote or what cable news you prefer, so many of us must recognize we are all part of one Jewish family. And at the end of the day, we need to rekindle the spirit that's connected our people for more than 2,000 years. So, from campus activists to communal leaders to clergy members, those of us in leadership roles need to reach across the political divide in pursuit of Jewish unity. And let me reiterate, for many of you watching who are not Jewish, in a larger sense, you are part of our family too, and we of yours, because ultimately we are all members of one American family. More than ever, we all need to come together in unity, with love and generosity, with empathy and understanding, to rediscover our common values and to join hands and repair the decaying foundation beneath our feet before it's too late. As President-elect Biden said just last night, it's time to give each other a chance to put away the harsh rhetoric, to lower the temperature, to see each other and to listen to one another once again. But it won't be easy. It will take work. It will take time. And it will take leadership from all directions. Not just top down from President-elect Biden or from me as the CEO of ADL, but bottom up, side to side, and ultimately from all of you. You are the ones who can bring about change. You are the ones who can beat back the forces of hate. You are the ones who can bridge, build bridges in our communities and in our country. And so, let us undertake this work of repair and restoration. And let us do it together. Thank you.
In 1965, ADL opened its office in Dallas to fulfill a promise that its national director, Ben Epstein, had made to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when they marched together in Selma. Dr. King probed how ADL would continue to fight for voting rights, and Ben Epstein committed that ADL would work in the trenches to guarantee the fundamental freedom of our democracy, the right for citizens to select their government. At a time when LBJ said that the right to vote is the most basic right, without which all others are meaningless, ADL recognized that its work to secure justice and fair treatment for all required a commitment to protecting voting rights for all citizens. During this election cycle, ADL's three Texas offices banded together to continue that fight. Represented by NYU's Brennan Center, we litigated voting access under pandemic conditions. Our Houston office paired with the NAACP to contest the state's pushback when Harris County wanted to send all registered voters information about absentee ballots. When the governor ordered that only one drop box could be available for absentee ballot return in each of Texas's 254 counties, ADL Texas, in partnership with Common Cause Texas, stood up for voters by challenging whether the governor had overstepped his authority in making access more difficult. ADL's work underscored the need for safe and accessible ballot return where voters needed them as being a crucial element to holding a fair election, particularly during a pandemic. More than half a century later, I am proud that ADL continues to protect the right to vote fulfilling our promise to Dr. King. Thank you, Cheryl, for reminding us of the need to protect every citizen's right to vote and ADL's long history of securing this hallmark of democracy. It is my distinct pleasure now to introduce the next session of Never Is Now, which focuses on something that I am sure has been on all of our minds and televisions this week, the election. Please join me in welcoming these inspiring experts who will help us navigate one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime. And now, hate and the 2020 election, what happens next? Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. And thank you for joining us today at the ADL Signature Summit, Never Is Now. My name is Amna Nawaz, I'm with the PBS NewsHour, and I am honored to be leading this conversation, which will focus on hate and the 2020 elections and try to answer the question, what happens next? And to do that, I am joined by an incredible panel. Let me introduce them right now, and I'm so excited to learn from each and every one of them. Jamie Gangel is with us. She is, of course, an award-winning veteran correspondent now with CNN since 2015. Prior to that, at NBC News since 1983, she spent nearly two decades as national correspondent for NBC's Today Show, covered everything you can think of, popular culture, hard news, and several elections as well. Jamie, welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I just want to say I realized the other day this was my 10th presidential election. So you know what the word veteran now means. <laughs> Old. <laughs> I was going to say, does that, is congratulations the right word for that? Or I'm sorry? I don't know. We'll, we'll dig into it. It's, it's an interesting bookend. Let's just say that. <laughs> Also with us today, Jennifer Rubin. She, of course, writes uh, opinion pieces for the Washington Post. She covers politics and policy, foreign and domestic issues, and provides insight into the conservative movement, the Republican and Democratic parties, and threats to Western democracies. Jennifer, thanks so much for being here. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. I um, am very pleased to be with this august panel and uh, with all of you watching at home. Thanks for having me. And finally, Joanna Mendelson is the Associate Director of the Center on Extremism for the Anti-Defamation League. She works to combat white supremacists, anti-government militia groups, terrorism, and all forms of hate in the real world and online. She's worked at the ADL since August of 2000, and to date, she has trained more than 12,000 federal, state, and local law enforcement officers, judges, and public officials nationwide. She's doing the real hard work. Joanna, welcome to you, and thanks for being here. 
Thanks so much, Amnon. Thank you so much for your leadership and for everyone on this panel to talk about the underbelly of our country today and a, a look into the extremism that's operating in this landscape. Well, there is so much to talk about for sure. And we're speaking on Sunday, uh, November the 8th. The context for this conversation maybe would have been a little different if we were speaking even yesterday morning or a week ago. So to answer the question of what happens next, we do have some kind of infrastructure. And I'm grateful for that because there's still a lot of questions. I think that's very fair to say. And Jamie, that's where we come to you, your 10th presidential election. First of all, the idea that we are still talking about hate and politics at this level, as, jo as Joanna just mentioned, mm -hmm. the white supremacy and the militia groups and everything that is still a very real threat. Just when you step back for a moment, can you believe that we are still having this conversation today? So I, I was thinking four years ago, I would have said that I would be surprised. But unfortunately, after the last four years and everything we've seen, I'm not surprised. I will say that watching Charlottesville was a real wake up call for me. And I think I would say that I felt that I was naive when I watched it. I was just rather amazed to see it out there in public so starkly, so proudly, uh, and then to watch the last four years with um, a word, two words that have become very, uh, we, we've heard a lot, dog whistle, and doubling down and tripling down. And then actually to see, we all thought um, we, meaning CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, a lot of us wrote about this election as being the coronavirus election. But when I saw the popular vote come in for Donald Trump, I thought we made a mistake in that. I really thought the coronavirus would be the issue. And I don't think in the end, that it was, I think what we're talking about here today is very much what this election was about. It is so interesting you say that because, you know, even for us as we were covering the election, I remember looking at the numbers and people would say, yes, the pandemic is one of my top issues or my top issue, but it was interpreted in a lot of different ways, like how you see the pandemic and what part of the pandemic you're talking about. Um, Jennifer, I'd love to bring you in on that point now, especially in this election, Jamie says, hate and, and some of those forces were very much one of the top issues driving how people saw this election. Do you, do you believe that was true? Absolutely. I think what the Trump years have taught us is that we are no different than other democracies around the world, which are struggling with right-wing populist, often anti-Semitic, invariably xenophobic movements and that they thrive in a social media atmosphere in which anyone can say practically anything. They subsist in a media environment that is entirely outside the sort of media outlets that Jamie just listed. Um, they operate um, with a shorthand and with a vocabulary and a reference point that is foreign to most of us. And that there are 70 million or so Americans who either operate there or are content to acquiesce, to enable that sort of mindset remains a grave challenge to America. And I think we still have not wrestled with this enormous cultural divide, racial divide, mindset divide. Um, and it will be, I think, with us for a very long time. Donald Trump was not the source of this problem. He brought it out from the, sh the shadows and he gave it voice and he gave it an air of legitimacy in some cases, but it's gonna be with us for a very long time. And the sorts of alliances, the sorts of structures that have grown up to try to wrestle with this, to try to contain this are gonna to have to survive and are gonna to have to continue because this is a, um, a, a fact of 21st century America at this point. Joanna, it's a great point I wanna bring you in on that Jennifer just made about the fact that, you know, we talk about this in the context of the last four years because we're talking about politics and this was this last 
presidential administrations, the current one, where a lot of this energy was focused, but it didn't begin there, right? I mean, is, has this just been part of the peaks and valleys of the way these forces show up in America? So you don't have to be an expert on extremism to understand that bigotry and civil unrest is at this all time or at disturbingly high levels. And I think that if you look at white supremacists and some of their messaging, this is the same old messages that we saw decades ago but it's just repackaged. There is a, a strategic effort to make their messaging more palatable. So whether or not it's in the words that they use to talk about Western identity or um, avoid the term race, don't have a blazing swastika and yet have the same ideals, the same tenor and the same tropes articulated is something that is very strategic by this current movement. Um, and, and the fact that, um, as Jamie noted, the fact that you saw white supremacists come out and bear their hateful ideology unmasked and unintimidated um, to shout, you will not replace us. That messaging we saw loud and clear where ADL had documented this was the largest white supremacist event in the last 10 years. So although we have historically tracked these groups in the shadows, we are seeing how the rhetoric, the anti-Semitism, the racism, the xenophobia, the xenophobia have essentially fanned the flames and have emboldened an extremist base that has then bled into some of the mainstream. Jamie, talk a little bit about where and how we've seen this before. Over 10 presidential elections, every, everyone has now said, none of this is new. It's the same old story packaged differently and being amplified differently and sort of manifesting itself differently because of technology and because of who's in charge. But there has been racism, there has been sexism, there's been xenophobia, there's been anti-Semitism baked into some political elements for years and years. Where have you seen it before? And what struck you about what's been different over the last four years? So one of the things I was thinking about when I said bookends is that the first campaign I covered was a uh, presidential campaign was 1984 with Jesse Jackson and then Jerry Ferraro. And we didn't talk about this a lot at the time, but there were so many threats against Jesse Jackson that at that time, um, I had two camera crews and two producers who traveled with me for all of those months. And the Secret Service really warned us about threats because Reverend Jackson was such a target. And we very, it was informal, but we worked out a system where one crew uh, and either I would be close or a producer would be close to Jackson but we were so concerned about a bombing attempt or an assassination attempt that one crew and one producer always stayed very far away outside what we considered a perimeter. We always had a plan about if that happened, who would get the tape back? Where would we go? That was part of our daily logistical planning. And so that's, I mean, it goes back before them, but that's, that's my first experience. It just, you know, and this is a question that the ADL frankly could answer better for me, but one of the things that has struck me it now is the internet and social media. And it's not just that it's the wild west and it's not just, that it's a sewer. It's a place where young people spend a lot of time and get a lot of information and are very vulnerable. And when I watched the last four years and I, when I saw the popular vote uh, this past week, I really thought to myself, how much of this is amplified? by social media 
and the and the internet. So Joanna, answer that question if you can. You mentioned technology briefly when we were chatting before our session. What role does it play? And also, I've been thinking about this a lot during the pandemic, during all the lockdowns, when everyone's stuck at home, a lot of people mm -hmm. online. Is there a concern that a lot of that was spreading more rapidly or more intensely during this year? Absolutely. And we've actually noticed this long term trajectory of extremists trying to harness the Internet to weaponize their hate. So whether or not you're looking at these horrific attacks in Christchurch or in uh, Poway um, or El Paso, where white supremacists have not only prepared their weapons and prepared their plot to harm and hurt others, the other, the ones that they disagree with, but they're also preparing their live streams. They're preparing their ability to uh, seed their hateful actions across the internet. And we're seeing efforts to produce propaganda, to create a narrative, to help create memes that illustrate their hateful ideology. We're seeing uh, um, um, robocalls that went out to 10 million people that mm -hmm. say it's not safe to, to, to go to vote to, tomorrow, or perhaps you should uh, vote the next day because the lines are too long. And so the ability to use technology to push their rhetoric um, and we're seeing it in a whole host of platforms. It's not just the mainstream platforms. ADL took a, a hard stand against Facebook with our Stop Hate for Profit, but we are seeing the lion's den of hate being proliferated in 4chan, in 8kun, in Telegram, in all of these really uh, dark spaces where the message is uh, reverberated and echoed by all sorts of extremists. Jennifer, this idea of the message, of the rhetoric, of what we hear, not just from these groups whose you know, interest it's in to push this out, but from our elected officials, not just in what they say, but what they don't say. How, how do you view all that, especially when you look at, as Jamie mentioned, how divided we are? You have over 70 million people who just voted for Donald Trump in this last election. Are some of the ideas so baked in that it, it doesn't matter? what gets said at the elected leader uh, level anymore? Well, you focus on, I think, um, the real challenge in the months and years ahead. And that is that one political party to one degree or another has decided that their political future depends upon supporting at the very least non-confronting um, this movement, these uh, people and this ideology, that they operate in a shorthand that they can go and have plausible deniability to quote a famous uh, phrase that they're not really saying the election was stolen. Instead, they're just saying we have to see through all of these legal challenges. Mm -hmm. They can say, we're not talking about race and fear of white uh, suburbanites. We're just talking about not having low house you know, low cost housing in the suburbs, that there is this constant effort to cajole, to wink, to encourage the more virulent strain of this in a way that does not entirely shock or repel other voices so that they walk this line between legitimacy and rabble rousing. They believe still to this day that their future as political players, as cultural figures, as incumbents depends upon tolerating and to a, in a certain sense encouraging this. And although we rightly see that this is, uh, there is extremism on the right, there's extremism on the left, we rightly see that the forum, the incubator for a lot of this is social media. When you get right down to it, the major problem that we have, I believe, is that one political party and one side of the political spectrum has been supporting this ego structure. And obviously with Trump, this phenomenon got much worse because then they felt they were supporting, quote, their president. They then 
thought that they were supporting, quote, his agenda. But what they have done is tied themselves to this cesspool. They have tied themselves to the rhetoric, to the language of white supremacy. Even the denial of racism, as we all know, is a fundamental part of white supremacy. You have to deny that anything is wrong and then support government authority, use of force, any structure possible, painting those who are looking for social justice as the violent ones, as the other. That is a fundamental structure within white supremacy. And I think we have to look for that in what many less virulent voices are saying. Uh, a authoritarian streak, a subversive and uh, sort of uh, paranoid view of all institutions, a contempt for elites, a resort to, frankly, anti-Semitic tropes uh, at the drop of the hat. All of this is um, now, I think, afflicting one of our major political parties. And that, I think, is the challenge, um, at least in the short run, to try to wean one of our national parties away from this and see if we can turn them to a responsible mainstream political outlook. Can I, I ask Jennifer? Jennifer? Yes, please go ahead. Can I just ask Jennifer? We, I hear a lot of Republicans talking about taking their party back from Trump. Do you think that's realistic considering the popular vote turnout for Trump? I think it's going to be a very long process. And many of us who were rooting for a complete landslide, a complete obliteration, were hoping, perhaps unrealistically, that if the electorate delivered such a message, that that process would be accelerated and that the people who have been saying this is not the way to go would have the upper hand. They don't. Um, and at this point, it is, um, I think, uh, the view of many who have been supporting Trump. And you see it because they're unable to, at this point, even acknowledge that he has lost. You see senators who are otherwise presumably logical, rational human beings continue to embrace that. So I think in terms of taking back the party, I'd like to think of it in a slightly different way. And that is creating a coalition from center right to center left of good faith advocates of democracy, um, small d democracy. And that that's the task. It's not to take back one party, but to cross party lines to have an ingathering, if you will, of people who believe in the rule of law, in a pluralistic democracy, in a free press, uh, and in objective reality. And that's, I think, a um, very long-term, very difficult task that we're gonna have to undertake. Jamie, there's a slice of all of this that I know Jennifer has written a lot about, and Joanna, you and your colleagues have looked into as well, but I'd love to hear from Jamie's perspective as a journalist, this, this uh, the flourishing of conspiracy theories, which have always kind of been there under the radar a little bit, and we as journalists fight hard to push back against with facts. But it also gets sad, you know, bringing facts to some of these conversations is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And I'm curious how you view this because none of this goes back in a bottle. I want to pitch forward now to see, you know, what this next presidency will inherit. This is all still very much out there. Right. It's, you know, in preparing for this panel, I was thinking about just the two words that we use to describe this, which is conspiracy theory. And I don't even like that term because using the word theory to me makes it almost give it some kind of credibility. Like you have this theory or you have that theory. I think one of the things we may need, and I don't have the answer, is different language to describe it. Uh, this, these are lies. These are ugly <laughs> lies. This is not true. It, it's we pick up terms to describe things. And I, I think maybe we need a better job with just the language. I am so concerned about this because we also give it a lot of time and attention. And I don't know how we put that genie back in the bottle, but one of the things I've been thinking about is 
as Donald Trump leaves office, I think it is likely to say he doesn't want to leave the spotlight. He wants to stay relevant. And so uh, a lot of these things he will try to keep in the spotlight. How much attention do we give him when he leaves? I, I think these are all challenges for news organizations that we're going to have to think about. He's not the president anymore, but unlike other former presidents who recede and understand the importance of receding, I think he's unlikely to do that. And so a lot of this language, these uh, conspiracy theories, these lies, whatever the new term is, I think we have to be very careful about what platform we give them. So you know, like to follow up on this. all that brain power here. Yes, please. Joanna, I want to get you on this. And Jennifer, I'd love to hear from you on this too. How should we talk about it? What should the language be? How should we treat this moving forward? Joanna, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, if you allow the notion, this convoluted conspiracy that um, that this election is stolen, that something has been taken away from people. There is a sense of loss and that rhetoric sows distrust and it breeds extremist ideology. That will actually give lifeblood for bad actors who feel that something has been taken from them and that they need to rise up and respond. And when we look at extremist ideology, we see them as vigilante. We see them um, kind of fashioning this notion that they are helping protect society, democracy, to save against the evil forces that threaten their existence. Whether or not it's white supremacists who feel that their future is bleak and that they're hanging on by a thread, that they're facing this notion of genocide or whether or not it's anti-government extremists who talk about this tyrannical order that is operating, that is helping to undermine their liberty and their protection. So what we're seeing is that the extremist narrative is eking into the mainstream. It is creating this general conversation. And unless we have political officials who speak out vehemently against the proliferation of these ideals, then we unfortunately will not help to change that narrative. When we have individuals like, uh, you know, Steve Bannon this last week, um, encourage violence and show images of decapitation of Fauci um, uh, uh, and the FBI director, this is, this is, this is uh, setting a stage, a very dangerous narrative that we need to challenge and push back against. Jennifer, what about you? What's your view on this? I think both mainstream and social media have still not come to grips with this phenomenon and how to treat him. Mm -hmm. Mainstream media during the 2016 election and throughout this president has tried to treat him like a normal president. The manifestation of this is the both siderism. On one hand, Trump says X. On the other hand, the Democrats say Y. It's an effort not to describe the degree of unhinged manic behavior, but simply to reconstruct, sometimes by splicing sentences together, what he said at a press conference, which gives the aura of rationality. It is the refusal to label a lie a lie. And this has been the struggle that mainstream media has tied itself up in knots. Now, I think we saw for the first time in the past few days, a little inkling of hope that really all of the networks, um, and we'll talk about Fox in a moment, but really all of them simply said, there is no basis for any claim of fraud. They called the election. They do not um, put on um, a, network um, analyst to advance Trump's um, false narratives. That ability to be loyal to the truth and to not simply choose to elevate and to present this as a legitimate point of view or a fact-based point of view has to be um, an ongoing concern for mainstream media. 
As far as social media, I don't have to tell the ADL what a struggle it is <laughs> to encourage, to induce, um, to use economic power so that social media platforms, which are so omnipresent in our life, become socially responsible actors, that they understand that their fate, that the fate of a free society depends upon attacking the voices of intolerance, or at least just not giving them a platform. You know, if Facebook made some baby steps in this election to mark Donald Trump's um, postings, if you will, as misguided, if Twitter um, put at the top of its um, feed that the that Biden had been elected president, if they can take those small steps towards defending truth, toward pushing out in the margins these voices of intolerance, the voices of um, chaos, of moral nihilism, they should be able to continue to do that in the future. And I think once again, when we're talking about projects going forward, let's build on whatever baby steps they took during this election, because the threat isn't going away. It's not that our democracy is now entirely secure and that the forces, the forces of intolerance have disappeared. They're just as strong, they're just as evident. And therefore I think it's both traditional media and social media that's gonna to have to continue to grapple with this. And I think the groups that have tried to educate uh, both social media and mainstream media, the groups that have explained the election process to mainstream media, have to remain engaged. They have to continue this education process. And mainstream media has to be far more self-reflective and less self-satisfied than it often may appear to be. Because this is not gonna end when Joe Biden is sworn in as president, it's gonna continue. Joanna, what needs to happen? What other steps? You heard Jennifer mention, we saw some of the labeling of tweets as, as uh, misinformation, um, Facebook taking some baby steps, as Jennifer mentioned. What, what else needs to happen? Jennifer, I, I love how positive, um, and, I, and I love the momentum that we need to kind of uh, carry on. And, and, and sadly, perhaps because of the vantage point in which I sit, we're looking at a backdrop of anti-Semitism um, at an all-time high, since, uh, the highest it's been since 1979, since we've been recording this. Um, domestic extremist murders are overwhelmingly perpetrated by right-wing extremists. In fact, last year, 90% were carried out at the hands of right-wing extremists and majority of them were white supremacists. So we've seen bad actors act on that and we need to continue our data collection. We need to partner with law enforcement in order to identify those who are choosing to translate that belief into violence. We need leaders who lead who uh, have a clarion call to, to, to stamp out um, uh, hate and not allow hate to, to basically um, thrive in a vacuum. Because these groups, when they don't hear the clear vocalization and denunciation of hate, it lowers our gu the guardrails. It creates this gray line. And we need people to speak out and say that is unacceptable from the highest levels of our office all the way down to local levels. So there is a lot of work to do with the tech industry, with education, law enforcement, um, and the public to shine a very, very bright light on this situation. Yeah, Jamie, I've been thinking a lot, especially in the context of some of these are social ills, the worst impulses among all of us and 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 these these groups that persist despite, despite, despite all the work being done. And I keep thinking about the opening line to that novel, The Go-Between, that the, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. At the same time, there is a sameness to all of this throughout much of our modern history. And as we see now what this next administration is tackling, they have a global pandemic that the numbers of which are increasing every day and they will inherit a really bad situation. Um, the economy needs immediate attention. There is a country deeply divided among all across all of these major issues. 
how does this issue factor in to an administration when it is so deeply imbued in our politics as well? And as Jennifer has mentioned, is likely to continue to be leveraged by some political forces. I think it's it's a huge issue. I, I, I have to say, just to go back to social media, I so appreciate every time on Twitter, I see a banner that calls out a tweet. I think that's very important. I don't understand algorithms, but I, I just hope we move in that direction. I think it, it would be hugely helpful. I, I think that Joe Biden has his work cut out for, for him with this, but I will say this. Last night, I took a walk around Washington, D.C. with my 25-year-old son. One of the advantages to the pandemic is my twins <laughs> are back home. And people were celebrating and horns were honking. And there was a weight taken off a lot of people's uh, minds that um, people have been having conversations. Am I going to be leaving the United States? Where do I go to to live? Real conversations. And so I think Joe Biden uh, and this new administration have to take that right along with the pandemic and, and the economy. I think these are three legs of a stool that they have to attack. And I think it's very important that they not forget. And, and he has said he won't the people who voted for Donald Trump. We, we've just, you know, I wish I could knew how to <laughs> make that all work, but I, I think those are the three legs of the stool that, that uh, Biden is facing. Jennifer, we have a few seconds left. What What is at stake for this next presidency when it comes to these issues? Well, Anna, as you were reciting your favorite quote, I was thinking of another one, which is the past is not even the past, um, that we carry with us this uh, burden of America's original sin with race. We shy away from confronting it. We're told by some of these same voices of hate that if you bring it up too much, you're just going to make it worse. You're going to make these people angry. So I think what is at stake is nothing less um, than the survival of a pluralistic, multiracial, multicultural democracy. We have to continue to grapple with this. We have to continue not simply to have reconciliation because reconciliation without accountability um, is not gonna cut it. We have to work towards an idea of social justice, an idea of really living up to those very American ideals um, all people are um, created equal, endowed with their creator, that we have to go back to these original American principles, embrace them, um, advocate for them, not allow them to be co-opted, not allow them to be transformed uh, so that America as an ideal, not as a platform for white Christian nationalism survives. And that's the great challenge ahead of us. Um, I think all of our other problems will remain problems, will remain impossible to rest until we all get on the same page of reality, all accept facts are facts, all accept basic principles of democracy. And that's the hard work that's gonna take years and years of work. So we all uh, had better get busy. A lot, a lot of work to be done. Um, and I'm reminded of words my friend Eddie Glad reminded me of last night from James Baldwin, uh, which is that hope is invented every day. So here's to another day. Um, thank you to all of you. This has been such an enlightening conversation, inspiring for me alone, I hope for everyone out there as well. My thanks to Jamie Gangel, to Jennifer Rubin, and to Joanna Mendelson for this very important conversation. Thank you for being here.
Now to introduce the recipient of one of ADL's most prestigious honors, the Courage Against Hate Award, is Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. He is the Yale School of Management Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies and the Lester Crown Professor of Leadership Practice. He founded the Yale Chief Executive Leadership Institute, the world's first CEO college. Jeffrey has also been named one of the world's most influential business school professors by Business Week. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Sonnenfeld to the screen. This is an enormous honor to introduce Ken Fraser of Merck for the Courage Against Hate Award, not only because he's a great friend of mine and an extraordinary business leader, but because I can't imagine anybody more qualified to receive this award. Raised in a part of Philadelphia, ridden with uh, violent street gangs and despair, his hero was his dad, a revered UPS porter who read three, four newspapers a day, a very knowledgeable guy. His, uh, Ken's commercial, financial, and scientific achievements are extraordinary for Merck shareholders, workers, and patients around the world. There's no pharmaceutical company in the world that exceeds Merck in long-term R&D investing, creating miracle drugs like Keytruda, which has helped well over 200,000 cancer patients or, or more a year. As for Merck's COVID treatment advances, Ken is humble about the promising therapeutics and vaccines and development at Merck coming along for the next year that'll be built upon past successes with Ebola and measles. He helped organize the CEOs of nine of his leading peers on the vaccine front to put out a message almost two months ago that, that science, not politics, will dictate the timetable for safe, effective vaccines. He's uh, long defended the scientific integrity of Merck, fortifying their reputation in past crises as a pillar of public trust, which is so core to their culture and their brand. At similarly at Penn State, as a board member, during a time of suppressed uh, abuse scandal, he drove a very important investigation leading to criminal accountability, top university leadership, house cleaning, uh, corrective procedures to protect uh, uh, kids from predators. And this resulted in the uh, return to sports leagues on campus and the restoration of Penn's public trust. In the aftermath of the 2017 murder in Charlottesville, Virginia, by Nazis carrying torches, chanting, Jews will not replace us, as they attacked peaceful protesters, President Trump equivocated, putting the villains and the victims on an equal plane, while other CEOs froze in silence. This was too much for Ken to ignore. He quit the high-profile President's Business Advisory Council. He spoke out on CNBC TV, I thought it was very active, he said, uh, and very important that uh, America's leaders must honor our fundamental values by clearly rejecting hatred, bigotry, and group supremacy. As a matter of personal conscience, I feel a responsibility to take a stand against intolerance and extremism. When the president immediately attacked Ken, the business community stood with him. He didn't hesitate, waiting for trade association cover PR advisors or public opinion polls to guide him, he relied on his own conscience. In the aftermath of this summer's horrible killing of George Floyd from police excesses along a stream of, of such police killings, we saw people treated as less than human. Penn's bold voice called out saying, this African American man could be me or any other African American man. The officials in Minneapolis didn't take action for four days until the community took to the streets. Ken called on the private sector to make a difference in this summer's defining moments, demanding social justice, citing opportunities in his childhood in Philadelphia to transcend the immediate neighborhood to, to study at better schools. Days ahead of this month's election, he went on CNBC to call on fellow business leaders to quote, encourage people to have the patience, the civility, and the restraint to actually wait for the outcome of the election and to trust the process. He helped catalyze the major business associations to craft a statement endorsing this mission. He's shown that doing good is not antithetical to doing well, demonstrating the message of Alexis de Tocqueville, a 200-year-old volume that he wrote on democracy in America, that our nation is founded on community trust or social capital. Two years ago, Ken presented civil rights legend and former UN ambassador, former mayor of Atlanta, former congressman, Reverend Andrew Young, 
our Legend and Leadership Award uh, at one of our CEO summits. And it was there that Andrew Young said, believe it or not, I almost have more faith in business than I have in the church, politics, or anything else I do. And the reason is there's more freedom and courage in our free enterprise system. Ken reinforces the needed freedom and justice for courage, for free enterprise system to work at its best, and for a better society. Tikkun olam, to repair. The closing line of Hendrik Ibsen's play, Enemy of the People, is the strongest person in the world is the person who can stand alone. That's Ken Fraser. The world is inspired by his courage to do the right thing and not just to follow a crowd. Nobody better to receive this award than Ken Fraser. Congratulations to Ken and the ADL for this brilliant selection. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. And thank you, Jeff, for that very kind introduction. I'm honored and grateful to receive the Courage Against Hate Award. Thank you for this special recognition and for all that the ADL does to advocate for a more just and tolerant world. This organization has fought for equality for over a century, not just for the Jewish community, but for the voiceless people of every race, faith, orientation, and background. You know what all people who suffer discrimination and social injustice know, that if hate lives anywhere, it lives everywhere and affects everyone. Today, our country is becoming increasingly polarized, intolerant, and angry. Many of us lock ourselves in residential enclaves and congregate with like-minded people. We send our children to schools that are increasingly segregated by race and social class. We tend to consume traditional and social media that agree with our biases. This allows us to hide in the false security of our own beliefs without opening our minds to different perspectives. In our political discourse, many of us resort to the lowest common denominator of groupthink, dehumanizing those we oppose, defeating the ideals that made our pluralistic nation strong in the first place. And now we're facing three simultaneous crises, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the economic downturn affecting a broad swath of households and businesses, and the harsh reality of the systemic social injustices that continue across America. The protest and the outburst of violence and destruction we've seen this year may have been ignited by the murder of George Floyd and similar egregious events, but they are fueled by the longstanding pain and anger of people across our country who have been denied the freedoms and opportunities that our democracy should provide to everyone. Opportunities for good health, unbiased treatment by police, quality education, and access to economic security. We cannot wait for another George Floyd tragedy to drive the momentum of reform efforts. We must all take responsibility now for driving the changes that will remove systemic racism and hate in our societies and commit to social justice and equity for all. At the same time, that we're becoming an even more diverse society, we are seeing a shocking reality, a resurgence of xenophobic, anti-Semitic, and racist ideas that play to people's fears and resentments. Fundamentally, we humans are homophilic. That's just a fancy word that means we tend to be somewhat tribal in nature. Human cohesion, or sense of belonging, helps us survive and deal with challenges that we face as members of our tribe, so to speak. But it can also lead us to suspect or even fear those who are different. Our subconscious is constantly aware of who is us and who is them. Perceived similarities of backgrounds and values make it easy for us to connect and build strong and lasting relationships with certain people. We all have these unconscious inclinations, or if you will, algorithms that affect our decision-making based on normative beliefs and behaviors, 
which stem from a combination of past experiences, customs, and traditions that have been passed down to us through the years. But there are downsides to our subconscious inclinations. When we are surrounded by people who are like us and see the world as we do, we fail to appreciate what we have in common with those we regard as different. The challenge is how to get beyond these beliefs and norms. The good news is that through self-awareness and empathy, we can. We can be reprogrammed. We can leave behind the dogmas of hatred and division. That is why we need ADL and groups like it. They can help us learn to appreciate rather than fearing or despising those who may think or look different than us. ADL understands that the rhetoric of hatred and bigotry cannot be ignored. It must be actively countered as it has real life consequences, incitement to discrimination, hatred, hostility, and violence against those we perceive as fundamentally different, especially marginalized groups. We know from historical as well as recent experience that there's a correlation between hateful and divisive rhetoric and hate crimes. One cannot think about Nazi Germany without thinking of the Holocaust. The late Elie Wiesel, a man of moral clarity and courage, reminded us that we must not stand silent when we see and hear hatred raising its ugly head, as was the case when threatening neo-Nazis descended upon Charlottesville, Virginia. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he said, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, whenever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Groups like ADL urge all Americans to take personal responsibility for helping to promote a society that is more just, rational, tolerant, and inclusive. In the U.S., we have never sufficiently grappled with our painful history with respect to racial oppression of African Americans, the consequences of which are still being felt today. The American institution of slavery was eventually abolished by the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution. But what the 13th Amendment actually did was end involuntary servitude. It did not end the pernicious beliefs that allowed Africans to be kidnapped, bound in chains, transported in the holds of slave ships, and held in brutal captivity for centuries in the United States, a country that was founded on the stated ideal that all men are created equal. It is though we're afraid to say out loud that slavery was morally justified by a deeply held ideology of white supremacy by the idea that black people are less evolved, less capable, less deserving than white people. The continuing evil of slavery and the following century in which Jim Crow, lynching, and other means of racial oppression were protected under color of state and federal law in these United States is the narrative of racial difference, the fiction that black people are less than fully human as our laws once held, just three-fifths of a person. Following the troubling death of George Floyd, I believe we are at a potentially defining moment, but that moment will pass unless we're willing to confront the presumptions of inferiority, dangerousness, and guilt that are assigned by many to people of color, and black people in particular. If we're going to achieve meaningful change when it comes to systemic racial injustice in America, which can be seen through disparities in education, housing, employment, law enforcement, and opportunity in general, we're going to have to be willing to take uncomfortable steps. 
We'll need the courage to face the unpleasant truths about our history of racial inequality. As Brian Stevenson puts it, we need an era of truth and justice, of truth and reconciliation. As leaders, it is incumbent upon us to help move our society past racial inequity and division rather than leaving this for future generations. Our society needs organizations like the ADL to help strengthen our resolve. You motivate us when we're falling short. You fight hate in all its forms, whether through anti-bias training for law enforcement or by standing up for marriage equality or exposing extremism. Your efforts echo the solidarity America has had in its greatest moments. Rather than fight for one community, you fight for equity for all. And by doing so, you make us all better. We have been seeking a fair and just America for nearly 250 years. But I remain hopeful despite the renewed pain 2020 has brought us. We must continue to raise our voices together, no matter our faith or race, so that we unite against hate and make sure others know it has no place in the communities and institutions we're building. Merck, like ADL, is an organization committed to helping to achieve inclusion, justice, and freedom for people around the world. Specifically, we're committed to helping people win freedom from disease and suffering. And we work hard to make sure that our products, like our Ebola virus vaccine, which is used to fight outbreaks of that deadly virus in Africa, reach the people who need them. And as Merck's CEO, I can bring opportunities to others by guiding the company to promote economic inclusion and social justice in all of our undertakings. Success requires moral leadership, people with vision who are guided by sound values, who can make principled decisions for the greater good, even if these decisions are economically or politically unpopular. We need leaders like my CEO predecessors at Merck, who put patients before profits and established a company committed to saving and improving lives. And those leaders of the ADL who understood injustice anywhere was a threat to justice everywhere, and so they united to stamp it out. So in closing, I thank the ADL for this tremendous honor. As an African-American man, I know I have been privileged in my life, privileged by educational opportunities that are not typically provided to inner city children. I try to remember the words of the late John Lewis, a man of great physical and moral courage and an icon for civil and human rights. He said, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. I try to do my part to extend those opportunities to others, and I would do so even if my work was invisible. But knowing others see it and feel it worthy of recognition brings me hope. No matter how hard the effort or how long it takes, we must persevere in our quest for social justice. I'm honored to accept this year's Courage Against Hate Award and to stand strong with you and all the great people of the ADL and Merck to demand the best of our country and ourselves. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Ken, for those incredibly poignant and inspiring remarks. I want to congratulate you on receiving this year's Courage Against Hate Award. I can't imagine a better recipient in this year where we face as a nation the many painful challenges that you outlined. You know, it's not easy to sum up the many reasons you exemplify this award, from your actions after Charlottesville, to your leadership during the pandemic, to your impactful statements following the murder of George Floyd. Hard to do in just a few minutes, but I think Jeff really put it beautifully Thank you for that, Jeff. We're truly fortunate to have leaders like you in this country. And I truly believe if we had more people like you in positions of power, our world would be a better place.
This event, the 10th anniversary of our Walk Against Hate and inaugural virtual Walk Against Hate, couldn't have happened without you. We have made a difference, raised our visibility, directly funded programs that fight anti-Semitism, racism, bias, and discrimination of all kinds. I want to remind you our work is not done. If we want to continue fighting hate for good, then we must continue the effort, speaking up, sharing facts, showing strength. We are stronger together. Thank you again to everyone who joined ADL's first national virtual walk against hate. It's proof that one can be inspired over tiny little Zoom boxes. The walk is just one way that ADL is able to raise funds to support its vital work, some of which Jonathan has discussed earlier this evening. And ADL is grateful for all of the supporters who have made this year's summit possible. We extend our special thanks to the visionary sponsors of Never Is Now, Edward Brodsky, Coca-Cola, L'Oreal, and Merck. Before we close, I remind you of how good it feels to click on that donate button at the top of your screen. It's so easy to do, and it makes all the difference. Thank you to all of you for joining us for this opening session of Never Is Now. We hope to see you for our full slate of programming on Tuesday and Thursday of this week and next from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Please be sure to check the Never Is Now website to sign up for sessions if you haven't already. I will see you back here on November 19th in a different outfit when we close our Never Is Now with another round of enlightening speakers. See you then.